I want to add one more reason why Acts 16 is so important. And you need to look at verse 6. I want you to notice the pronouns. The, the pronouns are in the third person in the beginning. Watch. They pass through the, Galatian, the Phrygian and Galatian region. Verse 7. They had come to Mycia. They were trying to go into Bithynia. Look at verse 10. When he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia. We. You see the difference? In verse 6, verse 7, verse 9, in the beginning of verse 10, Everything is in the third person. The author is talking about somebody else. But in the middle of verse 10, the third person, he or they, is changed to we. What does this mean? It means that at this place, in Acts 16, the author of the book of Acts becomes a missionary. What is narrative, historical narrative, becomes partial autobiography. Up until chapter 16, verse 10, he's writing about somebody else. From verse 10, he begins to write about himself. Remember on the first missionary journey, it started out to be Paul and Barnabas and John Mark. John Mark left in Acts 13.13. 13. In the second missionary journey, Paul splits with Barnabas, who takes John Mark with him, and Paul takes Silas with him. Paul and Silas go to Lystra, this place in Asia Minor where Paul was stoned. There they discover that a young man had been influenced by his ministry either converted or at least brought to a point where he wanted to be a preacher as well. That young man's name was Timothy. He joins them. They're in Asia Minor. They're trying to decide what to do. They're trying to go to various places in Asia Minor, but for one practical reason or another, superintended by the great supernatural reason, God won't let them. At this point, Paul receives a vision. There's a man in Macedonia across the water on the European continent who says, come on over and help us. At that point, in Acts 16.10, a fourth member of the missionary party is added. Paul, Silas, Timothy, and now Luke. Now there are four. And the fourth one is the writer of the third gospel in this great church history that we call the book of Acts. So the, these, this is one reason why Acts 16 is so significant. Now, notice that the vision comes to Paul, verse 9. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A certain man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. But Paul does not make the decision by himself. He's got colleagues. And again, we ask the, yes, recently we've been talking about this business of a call. How do we know we're called? Well, many times there's a confirmation with the people around us that yes, indeed, this is a call. And Paul did talk about it with them because it involved them. Paul wasn't going to go to Macedonia by himself. He was going to take Silas and Timothy with him. So he shared the vision, and they together determined that God was indeed calling them to that place. I want to say something else about a call, which we were talking about before. There's more than one kind of call. At one level, Paul received a call when he was converted and when he conferred with the Lord Jesus. And when, uh, you remember Ananias was told by Jesus that Paul was going to learn the things that he must suffer for the Lord. Well, that is a kind of call. But you know, there's, there's more than one call. 
there's what we might call a vocational call. What, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to be a teacher? Are we supposed to work in a bank? Are we supposed to work in a ministry? Are we supposed to make tents? That is, are we supposed to maintain a secular vocation so we can help support ourselves in the ministry? Or are we supposed to maintain a secular vocation where we make as, many, as much money as we can so we can support other people in the ministry? God doesn't call everyone to a vocational ministry. So there's, there's the call about what are we supposed to do? What is it that God wants us to do with our life? We call that a vocational call, a call to a certain profession. But there's also what we might call a locational call. Where are we supposed to do what we're supposed to do? Are you supposed to stay home? Are you supposed to stay in, stay in Kursk? Or are you supposed to stay in Russia? Or are you supposed to go to St. Petersburg or to someplace else in Europe or someplace in Africa or South America. That's a locational call. So Paul already had it clear what he was supposed to do. Now what he's trying to determine is where he's supposed to do it. And at this moment in Acts 16 he gets the where. He has a vision. He consults with his colleagues. and They determine we're supposed to cross the water and go into Europe. See, this is the story of the planting of the church in Europe. That's why it's really such a big deal. So, in verse 11, they cross, and in verse 12, they come to a town called Philippi. And at Philippi, they look for a prayer meeting. And they find a prayer meeting at a place beside the river. Now, we ask ourselves the question, why did the apostles come to Macedonia? Well, they received a vision. But we also ask the question, why did they receive a vision? Why did God send them a vision? It could have been because there were people praying. They come to uh, a river where there's a prayer meeting, and evidently the prayer meeting is only attended by women. You know, it's a sad fact for us men to recognize that usually women are more faithful than men when it comes to the things of God. That's sad, but it's true. Women were the last at the cross, and women were the first at the tomb. It was women, along with John, who attended upon the Lord in His death. It was women who showed up after His resurrection first and who brought the news to the apostles. And in this case, the church in Europe was planted practically in terms of causes because a group of women were praying and their prayers were answered. Don't ever, ever, ever underestimate the good that can come, the power that can flow through a group of women who are willing to pray. It may seem like a little thing. It might seem like an inconsequential thing. And again, I think it's said that many of the loneliest and most dangerous missionary outposts in the world are staffed by women. The first time I ever went to Iraq, there was a young Australian woman there. She'd been there five years, single, working in the villages. And she asked me, where are the men? I said, they're afraid. Most of the lonely missionary outposts in the world and dangerous outposts in the world are staffed by women. Most of the prayer meetings in the world have a majority of women attending. Apparently, this first great prayer meeting that we're told about in Europe was attended only by women. That's the place where the apostles go. The church in Europe was planted because of prayer, because there were a group of women praying. One of the women is named. 
Her name is Lydia. Now, it says that she's from the city of Thyatira, Acts 16, 14. Let me tell you why that's significant. Remember the apostles, at least Paul and Silas and Timothy, on the second missionary journey were not allowed to continue the ministry in Asia Minor. They were called, rather, to Macedonia and later Greece, going further south from Macedonia. But the first person who comes to a saving knowledge of Christ in Europe is from Thyatira. You know where Thyatira is? It's from Asia Minor. It's in Asia Minor. So, even though they geographically were in Europe, the first person who got saved was from the place where they just left from. So it's not like God is not concerned about Asians or the people in Asia Minor. He is concerned about those people. And the first person who was saved in Europe was not from Europe. She was from the place they just left from, the place where they would visited on their first missionary journey. It says that the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things which were being taught by Paul. And she, verse 15, and all her family were baptized. You know, a little bit later, um, the Philippian jailer and all his family were baptized. We're going to read about that in a moment. When I was um, 33 years old, a long time ago, the Lord gave us our second child. And when our second child was born, our, our only son, I realized I'm the head of a household now. I've got more than one child. We have a household. And I wanted my whole household, all my children, we have three children. We have one, four children, one child in heaven and three children on earth. I wanted all my household to know the Lord and to serve the Lord. And I asked myself the question, how does that happen? And so at that moment, I went to Acts 16 because all of the household of Lydia were baptized and all the household of the Philippian jailer were baptized. And I asked myself the question, why? What was it? that caused the whole family to come to faith. And I found 12 things, 12 things in Acts 16. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the 12 things were. That, that's another study, but, I'm, but I'll mention one of them. In both cases, Lydia and the Philippian jailer invited the missionaries into their home. And so those children, those members of the household, they saw missionaries in their home receiving hospitality from their parents. And it made an impact on them. Can you imagine growing up in the first century with the memory that the Apostle Paul was a guest in your home? Can you imagine that? and what an impact his presence must have made, the stories that he told, the power of his personality. And so if we want to have an impact on our families and on our household, we should model what it is to entertain those who take the gospel to the whole world. Those are the kinds of people we should want to have under our roof. Those are the kinds of people we should want to have sleeping in our guest rooms and sitting at our table. And that's one consistent correspondence between what Lydia did and what the Philippian jailer did. And both saw the conversion of their entire families. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TFS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. 
Okay, now verse 16 says that they continued to go to the prayer meeting. You know, we have a, a phrase in English, it's called cherry picking. And cherry picking means when you exploit something just the, for the sake of taking the best from it and leaving the rest. You take the best, you leave the rest. That's cherry picking. And here's what some people do in ministry. They may be starting a ministry or thinking about starting a ministry, or maybe they've already started a new ministry, so they'll visit another ministry and they'll try to recruit people from that ministry to the new ministry. Maybe somebody's planting a church, so they go to another church and they try to get people out of that church to come to their church. It's not very ethical. It's not, it's not a very cool thing to do. It's not quite right and ethical. We call it cherry picking. Why am I talking about that here? Well, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke they didn't just go to the prayer meeting to try to get people out of the prayer meeting to come to their meetings. They kept going to the prayer meeting. They kept supporting the prayer meeting. Because it says in verse 16 that they were going to the place of prayer. In other words, they were going back to this place of prayer where they had originally met Lydia when there was a slave girl. Now, this slave girl evidently had some sort of gift, a gift of discernment, a gift of being able to see things or understand things in a supernatural way. The problem is that she received that gift from a dark power. She did not receive that gift from a good source. She received that gift from an evil source. In a word, this young girl was possessed by a demon. And she um, was controlled by certain greedy men who exploited her condition to try to make money from her. And it says that she followed Paul and the other missionaries, and she kept crying out to them. Look at verse 17. These men are bondservants of the Most High God. Who are proclaiming you the way of salvation. Now look at those words and tell me what's wrong with those words. Do you see any error in those words? Do you see anything that's not true in that sentence? Of course not. What she says is absolutely true. But she continued doing this for many days. And what that means is that evidently for many days, the apostles would keep going back to the prayer meeting. For many days, they kept being faithful to the prayer meeting. They keep going back to the prayer meeting. But on their way to the prayer meeting, this girl would walk up to them and begin crying out, these men are bondservants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. It says in verse 18 that Paul was greatly annoyed. This bothered Paul. He didn't like it. What does that mean? Why didn't he like it? What the girl said was true. We must never underestimate the cleverness of the devil. The devil is not wise. The devil is the biggest fool in the universe. But the, but the devil is clever. He's very, very clever. And he knows lots of tricks. Why was what the girl said, which was absolutely true, why was it a bad thing? Well, there are two reasons it was a bad thing. Number one, everybody in town knew what this girl was. Everyone knew that she was possessed by a demon. So the words that she spoke were controlled by a demon. The demons were controlled by the devil. So this endorsement this improve, approval that she was given to, giving to Paul and the other missionaries were known by the other people in town to be an endorsement or imp approval that's given by the devil. So you see, this was, this was bad publicity. You know, if a man comes, 
into a town and he's preaching evangelistic messages, say, outside in the marketplace, and all the prostitutes gather and say, He's wonderful. We love Him. That's not a good thing. Because all the people know who the prostitutes are. Well, this girl was a kind of spiritual prostitute. She had a bad reputation. So if she was praising the apostles publicly, that did not help them. That was not a good thing. The second thing is she was probably very weird. She was probably very strange in her presentation. What she said was true, but she probably said it in a weird voice. She probably said it dancing around with a strange expression on her face. So that even though what she said was true, it didn't help them. It hurt their reputation. Now, for a long time, Paul doesn't do anything. He just takes it. He just endures it. He just puts up with it. But Luke tells us in verse 18 that it continued for many days. And as it continued for many, many days, Paul was finally provoked, and he turns and addresses the demon in the girl. He doesn't speak to the girl. He speaks to the demon. He goes to the, directly to the root of the problem. He says, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And the demon did come out at that very moment. Now, when she lost the demon, she lost her financial value. She was no longer a freak. She was no longer somebody strange enough for people to want to be around to see something, something unusual happen. And she lost her ability to have this unusual discernment. And her masters, these men who owned her and these people who made money from her misfortune, they understood that. And when they realized that Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy had helped this girl and had freed this girl, they took Paul into court. Now, your parents grew up hearing how terrible, how terrible America is and how terrible capitalism is. And we grew up hearing how terrible the Soviet Union is and how terrible communism is. Well, the reality is capitalism is not the answer. Christ is the answer. Capitalism can also be a terrible thing because greed can consume people. And, you know, many of us were told what a threat communism was to Christianity. But, you know, capitalism is also a threat to Christianity. And in this passage, Acts 16, it was the capitalists who tried to stop the gospel. Because the gospel brings a kind of freedom, and people make money off slavery. And the gospel brings a kind of purity and a kind of holiness. And people make money out of dirt and impurity. So when the gospel begins to impact a society, the people who make money off slavery and the people who make money off dirt, they feel threatened and they begin to fight against the gospel. And that's what happens in this passage of Scripture. Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy are opposed and threatened by the capitalists, the wicked capitalists, who take them in front of the judge and say, these men are throwing our city into confusion, and they're Jews. They play the racial card. They bring in racism. They're Jews. We need to get rid of them. They're, they're teaching laws which are opposed to our Roman laws. 
And see, they don't care anything about that. The only thing they care about is they used to make money off this girl, and now they're not going to make any money off of her anymore. So they, so they oppose the apostles on that basis. Now look at verse 22. They tore their clothes off, and they beat them. Verse 23 says that they hit them many times, and they threw them into prison. As a matter of fact, it says in verse 24 that they threw them into the inner prison, the prison which was the hardest to escape from. Let me just tell you, if we're going to take the gospel to new places, it's going to cost something. Somebody's going to suffer. Somebody's going to be beaten. Somebody's going to die. That's what happened in the book of Acts. But why do we take the gospel to places, even though the, in those places we may be beaten up, we may be imprisoned, we may die? The reason is because one day everybody's going to die. Everybody's going to die. And we, we take the Bible to these places to try to rescue the dying. That's what missions is. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.